inducted into the National Space Club Florida Committee's Space Worker Hall of Fame in the category of Space Launch Technology. Patrick is a nationally recognized model rocket competitor and currently resides in Rockledge with his wife, Mary Kernan McCarthy. And I'm going to add, uh, doing a little research on Pat, I found he also wrote when he was in, at Embry-Riddle, wrote for the Avion, and he's a member or was a member of the Society of Collegiate Journalists. So with that being said, I can't believe I got through that without stumbling too bad there, Pat. I'm going to turn this over to our honored guest, Pat, if we all could mute our uh, mics so he has the floor, I would appreciate it. And uh, Pat, this is all yours. Thanks so much, Bart and uh, Edmund for pulling things together. I appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you a little bit about uh, what Space Florida is and what we do, a little bit about what I'm working on. I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about what's coming up in the in the near future and perhaps a little bit about the far future here in the state of Florida. So just to give you the quick, uh, the really quick background on aerospace history in Florida. Well, you folks in the Tampa chapter are aware that uh, in 1914, the first regularly scheduled commercial airline service uh, flew across Tampa Bay from St. Petersburg to Tampa. Uh, Tony Janus was the pilot. And Abe Field, the former mayor of St. Pete, was the first uh, paying passenger. And at the time, I think he spent several hundred dollars. It was an auction that they held to get that seat. And he spent the equivalent of about uh, five or $6,000 in today's money for what ended up being about a 20-minute flight or so across the bay. So uh, that was a pretty uh, auspicious start to commercial airline service. Uh, over here at the Space Coast at the Cape, uh, we've been in business since 1950, the first launch in July 1950, and we've had 3,700 major launches since then. Uh, that does not include all the super small sounding rockets that we flew, uh, meteorological rockets and things, but 3,700 missile tests, uh, interplanetary probes, uh, satellite launches, and uh, several of the uh, uh, major missions to the moon flew from here. All the human missions to the moon took off from here at the uh, Cape Canaveral spaceport. And nowadays we're seeing a little bit of a transition from a government to a commercial operation. So I'll tell you a little bit about Space Florida and who we are. Uh, back in 2006, then Governor Jeb Bush and the Florida State Legislature signed us into being you want to read some exciting stuff, go look up Florida Statute 331, which tells you all about the uh, powers and authorities that Space Florida has. Our aim is to be the single point of contact for aerospace development here in the state. We have a pretty unique position uh, to expand the state's leadership in new space markets. And uh, through that, we have several significant authorities and economic development powers, including things like we can issue bonds and we can, uh, uh, we could even tax things. We could uh, have pest control services. If I wanted to have uh, mosquito control, I could actually do that. And uh, the, our main aim is to improve and streamline the processes and the regulatory environment to help uh, commercial operators uh, here in uh, the Cape Canaveral spaceport, as well as around the state. There are several other spaceports, including the uh, uh, Cecil Spaceport, just outside Jacksonville, at the former Cecil Field Naval Air Station. Jacksonville Aviation Authority has uh, got their FAA spaceport license. And recently, the uh, Titusville Coco uh, Space Center Executive Airport got their FAA spaceport license as well. So we have three spaceports here in the state. Space Florida is a both a public corporation and an independent special district which is kind of an unusual setup in the state. There are not that many independent special districts. I would say the uh, probably the most well-known example is one called the Reedy Creek Improvement District. And if you don't recognize that, you certainly recognize the land that they own and operate, and it's uh, Disney World. So all the Disney properties is under the Reedy Creek Improvement District, and they have several of the same kind of powers that we do. 
But two of the main things that uh, Space Florida does is act as a spaceport authority and uh, an industry development role. Now, as a spaceport authority, we uh, handle all the statewide planning for uh, both uh, Cape Canaveral Spaceport, CECL, and uh, the Space Center Executive Spaceport. So uh, we develop infrastructure, we can build and own uh, facilities, we can operate facilities, we can issue bonds, and we can lease the properties back to commercial customers. In the industry development role, we have several unique financial tools, uh, such as conduit lease financing. We can help folks find uh, access to capital markets. We can give companies uh, some tax efficiencies by the way things are set up. And we can also build facilities and turn them over to uh, commercial operators. And our mission is to build a, a world leading aerospace and space industry here in the state. Now, I'm, I'm an operator, not a finance expert, but here are some of the financing tools that we can use. Conduit financing is a, probably the uh, at the forefront of the tools that we have and allows uh, companies to uh, access assets uh, through a different way than if they were to own it themselves. Synthetic leases is another way they can uh, take their liabilities and turn them into expenses, and that way they can write them off. Uh, we can secure property. We've taken over several surplus or excess facilities from uh, both NASA and the uh, Air Force and turn those over to commercial operators. And we can set up uh, a lot of business infrastructure and facilities. And, and we've done uh, nearly $2 billion in various uh, aerospace assets here. And we also help to improve the regulatory climate. So we work uh, very closely with NASA and the Air Force and now the Space Force as well as the um, uh, FAA to improve the regulatory uh, operations for commercial operators. And we've got uh, folks in place to help provide step-by-step -step support throughout the projects. Just a quick look at uh, how much financing we've deployed in, in the last uh, several years. We're, we're now over a billion dollars worth of financing, which has been deployed to assist uh, companies uh, in setting up business here in the state. And uh, we've brought in both the state funding and outside financing from, from several banks. Some examples of how we did uh, conduit financing. Uh, Launch Complex 41, which is uh, owned and operated by United Launch, Launch Alliance. Uh, basically, Space Florida owns uh, a lot of the infrastructure there and we lease it back to to ULA for them to operate. Uh, the Atlantis exhibit, if you've been over here to Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, you see that fabulous building where the uh, uh, Orbiter Atlantis is now kept and is uh, a really fabulous looking uh, tourist destination here at the Visitor Complex. Uh, the state helped with financing for that. Uh, some of the more recent projects, Northrop Grumman, uh, in the last couple of years, we helped with financing their new uh, B-21 bomber design center of excellence at the Melbourne airport. Uh, for you folks over on the West Coast, uh, you probably heard, and some of you may work at CAE USA, their uh, US headquarters is out at Tampa International. And just a couple of years ago, we uh, signed a deal with them to help provide financing uh, for their new facility. Uh, in the center, OneWeb Satellites here in Merritt Island, uh, they've got a factory that uh, produces about uh, one satellite a day, and they're building up their own uh, uh, global internet uh, connectivity constellation of satellites, and all those satellites are built right here. Uh, Ember Air recently opened a new engineering and technology center at the Melbourne airport as well, and that was uh, something uh, Space Florida owns those facilities. We helped build them and we lease them back to Ember Air so they can write those things off on their books as a lease expense, as opposed to having to depreciate the assets themselves. One of the more recent ones, and the one that's really exciting for uh, especially Embry-Riddle folks, is Aeron Supersonic is gonna be building their design and production campus here at Melbourne International. And so they're gonna bring in uh, two to 300 uh, engineers and production uh, workers to build the uh, supersonic business jet, the AS-2. We're really looking forward to that. 
One of the big partnerships we have is with the Florida Department of Transportation or FDOT. Now, several of the things that we've done with them in the past several years is uh, the Spaceport Improvement Program. Interestingly enough, Florida DOT uh, recognizes space transportation as just another mode of transportation, just like uh, roads and rails, uh, seaports and, uh, and airports. Um, spaceports are another mode of transportation in the state. So uh, FDOT has deployed uh, funding for several different projects here in the state, most of them here at the uh, Cape Canaveral Spaceport. The uh, SpaceX uh, complex at uh, Launch Complex 39A, uh, we deployed $32 million there. Uh, out of Complex 41 with United Launch Alliance, we helped build the crew access arm and we're building several of the upgrades for their new Vulcan rocket out there. Uh, Complex 40 at uh, Cape Side is uh, the other SpaceX launch pad and we deployed $20 million in funding to help uh, support that. Uh, on the left there, the commercial crew and cargo processing facility and the orbiter processing facility below that. These were uh, excess assets from NASA. They used to be the orbiter processing facilities that handled the space shuttle. And when that program ended in 2011, NASA had no plans to utilize those facilities. And in fact, they were probably going to go fallow. So Space Florida and the state with FDOT's cooperation stepped in. We provided uh, several million dollars worth of funding to uh, uh, clear out the shuttle era infrastructure in those buildings and make them ready for Boeing to move in and bring in their production equipment. So the uh, C-3PF, as we call it, uh, the crew and cargo processing facility is where Boeing is building the CST-100 Starliner spacecraft, uh, which is gonna be uh, taking US astronauts back and forth to the space station. And in the orbiter processing facility number one, that as the sign on the side says is the home of the X-37B. So the mini shuttle that the uh, Air Force flies uh, from uh, here and in Vandenberg, uh, all the processing for pre-launch and post-launch is handled there. And again, we helped uh, fund the clean out of the uh, excess equipment that NASA had in there from the shuttle and made it available for uh, these new vehicles. We also work with uh, utilities. So the commercial power project out on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, we worked with Florida Power and Light uh, to bring in new uh, high tension lines out there to service the, uh, the space center. And we're working on a helium pipeline, which is gonna provide uh, purge gas to all the new launch vehicles uh, out on the Cape. Out at Complex 36, we helped Blue Origin uh, with their commercial launch site. And I'll show them a little bit more about that in a second. But the point is that uh, over a billion uh, dollars worth of uh, both state and private financing has been deployed and we're well over 2,000 jobs created, which is one of the main uh, foci for what we want to do here at Space Florida. Some of the other infrastructure, this is for uh, SpaceX. As I mentioned, we helped them build uh, several things out at Complex 40, both the payload encapsulation facility and several launch facility upgrades. This was a uh, former uh, Titan launch pad that the Air Force ran. And then when that program ended, uh, that became excess and available to us. And we helped uh, SpaceX uh, take over and fix up that facility. We're building several new things on the upper left. They're going to have a space vehicle processing and operations center on Merritt Island. Uh, and they're also uh, have done several modifications out at the former space shuttle launch pad 39A. So we helped with uh, several modifications to support the giant Falcon Heavy rocket and to build several of the upgrades to the crew tower. And you can see at the bottom that the majority of the investment comes from the companies rather than just the state. For uh, Blue Origin infrastructure, uh, they have a over a million square foot facility where they're building their new Glenn uh, orbital launcher on Merritt Island. And we've uh, assisted with that. We, uh, basically lease the land. We have a long-term uh, uh, enhanced use lease from NASA for the property. So the Space Florida took over the property and we sublease it to Blue Origin. Uh, so they built their manufacturing complex and their rocket test and refurbishment complex there on Merritt Island. 
and they've sunk over $200 million of their investment into that area, and as well as uh, on the order of 500 jobs. Out at the tip of the Cape, uh, Launch Complex 36, which is a, a former Atlas Centaur launch pad, has now been converted over and completely rebuilt to support the New Glenn launch vehicle. And this photo on the uh, bottom of the slide doesn't really do it justice. You have no sense of scale here, unfortunately. Uh, but the water tower is the, uh, I understand, is the tallest in the world. It's about 325 feet tall. The two lightning masts uh, next to the water tower are, are over 530 feet tall. And the vehicle uh, is going to be built on Merritt Island, rolled across Merritt Island and Kennedy Space Center down through Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and get integrated in that giant building there on the left. And that building is about 15 stories tall and over 400 feet long. So their rocket is on the order of 350 feet tall and uh, it's gonna be do final integration in that processing building and then roll out to the pad up next to those lightning masts and be uh, hydraulically stood up and fueled and launched from there. Uh, this is a extremely large rocket. It's going to be uh, on the order of uh, a Saturn V moon rocket class when it comes to thrust and how much payload it can put into orbit. So it's going to be very impressive. That's probably about a year and a half to two years away from flying. Uh, the launch pad is coming along very nicely and is almost uh, almost ready to support a mission. One of the other interesting things we did was the... Uh, uh, an infra project, uh, the US Department of Transportation has the Infrastructure for Rebuilding America or infra program and the State Road 405 bridge, which goes between Titusville and Kennedy Space Center right next to the visitor complex was in dire need of repair and replacement uh, because it was built back in the 60s and supported uh, you know, all the efforts that uh, NASA did during the moon program and the space shuttle program. But it's uh, seen better days and it's beginning to be derated because it's not strong enough. Well, if Space Florida put in a grant for uh, some US DOT funding under this infra program uh, and working closely with NASA, Florida DOT, the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization, and, and the uh, State Department of Transportation to uh, finance and uh, of deploy this infra grant. So Space Florida is going out and getting the financing. Uh, about $30 million, which is a match to the uh, majority of the funding, which is coming from the US DOT. This bridge is going to be on the order of $120 million or so to build. And then FDOT is going to build the replacement bridge themselves. So the other thing, aside from uh, helping with infrastructure is uh, we act as a spaceport authority. And here's some of the things that we're working on. On the left, you can see the Cape Canaveral spaceport with, uh, you know, we've got tagged, kind of hard to read here, but just uh, be known that, you know, even though the space shuttle program ended several years ago, both NASA and the Air Force and Space Force and commercial operators are still, still very active. So all these tags here show the various facilities and launch pads and processing buildings that are in place uh, on both the Kennedy Space Center side and the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station side. So there's still a lot going on. And uh, we are uh, at Space Florida are working to become the uh, spaceport authority, much like an airport authority that would run the infrastructure at an airport, the runways, the terminals, the, the roadways and the utilities. Uh, we're working closely with uh, NASA and with the Space Force to help uh, do those kinds of things here at the Cape Canaveral Spaceport as well. Two of the main things that I work on are the uh, our launch complex out at 46 is at the very tip of the Cape. And we helped refurbish this pad. It was originally built for uh, Navy Trident uh, ballistic missile uh, testing. And uh, in the mid 90s, the state came in and helped uh, convert it over to a multi-use launch pad, which can support uh, commercial and DOD and NASA missions. So we've had two launches there uh, most recently. Uh, we did the uh, ascent abort test, which NASA flew to test out the escape rocket 
for the Orion capsule before it flies uh, on the uh, space launch system. So the photo on the right shows that launch from last July. So we maintain the uh, explosive sighting, basically the safety uh, setup for uh, what can operate out there. We did the environmental assessment to uh, support these various vehicles. And we built the lightning protection system towers, which you see there uh, on the right-hand side. And uh, we are working with several of the small launch vehicle companies to come out here and do both their test flights and their operational missions. Uh, there's probably about uh, half a dozen that we're talking to, and uh, several of them do want to come here and fly their, uh, their equatorial orbit missions from Complex 46. Out at the, uh, what used to be the shuttle landing facility, now we refer to it as the launch and landing facility because we do more than just land. We can also launch vehicles from here, the horizontally launched type uh, vehicles. Uh, this map shows uh, the planning we have in place. We've done the environmental and uh, early engineering plans for uh, putting up all the common use infrastructure out there. And then we'll make these various uh, plots here. You can see in different colors, make those available to several different companies that want to put up hangars or build uh, factories and uh, fabrication facilities here. And then they'll have access to that uh, three mile long runway uh, where the space shuttle used to land. On the right side, it shows the, uh, you know, at present we have one big hangar and a smaller T hangar. We got a, a very large ramp uh, that leads out to the runway. Uh, the second photo there on the right shows the X-37B, which as I mentioned before, launches from here at the Cape, gets processed uh, at the, uh, one of the former orbiter processing facilities. And then the Air Force launches it on top of Atlas V or SpaceX Falcon 9 rockets. And then after spending, uh, you know, X amount of days in orbit, it comes back to land on the, the LLF. Uh, we also use uh, that runway to support things like, uh, here's an Antonov uh, 224 coming in to land or 225. Uh, so we have, uh, certainly have room for C5s and Antonovs to come in. They'll bring in rocket parts or satellites. Uh, to the space center and can offload right there and take them from there out to the pad to be integrated. Uh, and the lower right is a F-104 Starfighter. The uh, Starfighters company uh, has uh, owned and operates about uh, eight or nine of these uh, former uh, fighter jets, these F-104s, which are a Mach 2 capable uh, aircraft. They have several contracts with NASA for high-speed research, and they also uh, uh, allow you to go up and do space tourism kinds of things. If you want to fly Mach 2, they'll uh, strap you in and take you uh, at high speed or up to, you know, 70 or 80,000 feet in a, a zoom climb kind of thing and get you some zero G time. Our focus here at the, uh, the launch and landing facility is to, to get customers set up for that. We are building the utilities corridor. Uh, we are in charge. We've taken over all the maintenance of the runway. So uh, in fact, we're going to be repainting and restriping the runway here in the next couple of months. We're replacing uh, all the runway lighting uh, out there, and we're in charge of all the environmental protection of that uh, facility as well. So that's another place where we have a, an enhanced use lease from Kennedy Space Center, and we can develop all these properties, as you see here on the map. One of the other exciting things about the, the uh, launch and landing facility is that uh, just about a month ago, we got uh, our re-entry site operator license from the FAA Office of Commercial Space Transportation. This is the first commercially licensed orbital landing facility in the world. Uh, our first customer is gonna be the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser. This vehicle launches on top of an Atlas V, uh, goes up and docks with the space station and delivers cargo and can also bring cargo back uh, and it, it's a lifting body, so it uh, glides back to a reentry unpowered, and we'll be landing on the, uh, the LLF runway after performing its missions at the space station. Uh, at first, it's going to be strictly a, uh, an uncrewed vehicle, um, autonomous to bring uh, cargoes to and from the space station, uh, but then it is going to uh, transition over to become a crew delivery vehicle as well 
uh, in, in probably the next five years or so. But they do have a contract for cargo delivery. And the thing about this is, since it's a gliding reentry, it comes back at uh, uh, much less uh, Gs than what you would get on a capsule. So, for example, the SpaceX uh, Dragon capsule and the Boeing Starliner capsules are probably going to uh, load you up with five or six or maybe even seven Gs on the way back. Whereas the Dream Chaser, since it's a lifting body, is only going to subject you to about three Gs. So the good thing here is that's a lot easier both on astronauts and on the experiments and cargo that uh, are brought back. So if something's been on the space station for months in microgravity, uh, you don't want to overload it on the way back and, and destroy your experimental results. So you bring it back on a lifting body, it's going to come back at a much lower G load and take it easy on the experiments. But we're really looking forward to this in the future. Some of the other things we do out at the uh, runway now, I don't have a slide for it because there's just so many things that we do, but um, since it's three miles long and it's uh, extremely flat, there's only about a quarter inch uh, difference in height uh, from one end to the other. It, yes, it's sloped from uh, off to the sides to help drain the water, but it's uh, exceptionally flat throughout its length. So we have several uh, automobile and trucking companies that come out here and test their vehicles. Uh, Tesla has been out there in the past couple of weeks. We've had uh, Jaguar, we've had uh, several um, high-speed racing teams out here. The Mario Andretti IndyCar team has been here. Uh, we've had NASCAR racers come out and test in, in the past. Uh, folks come out with their trucks. Volvo Trucks was here to do uh, aerodynamic testing on some of their uh, vehicles here as well. Uh, and we do other things such as uh, um, laser testing uh, that we can set up uh, laser communication terminals on either end. And of course, we have a very good uh, idea of what the meteorological conditions are on the runway. So the, the laser folks can use that to test out their systems and they have a very good understanding of what the, the atmospherics are like when they're doing that kind of testing. So we, uh, Space Florida rents it out to several different companies to uh, do these, what we call straight line tests. Uh, and, uh, you know, somebody, who else has been there? We've had uh, Gulfstream uh, Aerospace has been here testing out uh, some of their G5s and I think G6s as well. Some of the other uh, common use improvements we've done, I think I already mentioned about the Florida Power and Light Project to bring out new uh, high power systems to the uh, uh, Air Force Station, the Space Force Station. We are working with the Air Force. We're getting a license to over 200 acres at uh, a fallow launch pad at Complex 20, which hasn't been used since uh, the mid 60s. We are going to develop that into three different launch pads to support several uh, small launch vehicle customers. So the idea is that you may not have to buy and build your own launch pad. You may just want to rent one from us and we'll provide you with all the utilities and infrastructure you need to launch. Some of the things coming up in the, in the near future for us, obviously commercial operations are really driving growth. I think everybody recognizes the, the gentleman in the upper left and the lower right. So Elon Musk obviously has really turned the space launch uh, industry on its ear or on its head and is uh, flying reusable boosters and uh, has lowered the prices considerably. Uh, Jeff Bezos there on the lower right and his new launch vehicle, the New Glenn, which is pictured on the, the upper right, which is gonna be flying from Complex 36 uh, probably next year. Uh, and Firefly Aerospace there in the center, they're a small launch vehicle manufacturer they are currently based in Austin, Texas, but they're going to be building their manufacturing facility here on Merritt Island. And they're gonna fly from complex 20 there in the uh, process of uh, doing their design work to take that old launch pad and turn it into a new one. Obviously uh, small launch is uh, one of the waves of the future. Um, there are so many small sats, you know, on the order of a couple hundred pounds or, or cube sats, which only weigh a few pounds. 
microsats, which uh, are very, very small. Um, there are several manufacturers that are looking to get into that market. So the upper left is Firefly. As I said, they're going to be flying from Complex 20 here. Their first test flight is going out of Vandenberg uh, within the next month or so, and then they're going to build their launch pad here and fly uh, their equatorial orbit missions from here. Uh, the lower left is a company called Relativity. They have taken over one of the other old launch pads at the Cape, Complex 16, and they are turning it into their launch pad for a, uh, a small launch vehicle. And most of you probably recognize uh, Virgin Orbit there on the right with their 747. Uh, they just had their first successful orbital mission uh, a few weeks ago. We uh, fully expect them to come to the uh, launch and landing facility at the Cape and fly from there as well. Right now they're based in Mojave out in California, but we fully expect them to come to Florida for some of their missions. And in fact, we are getting ready to build some of the support infrastructure that they need out on the runway uh, for things like uh, power and uh, propellant handling gear. Some of the things we're gonna see in the, in the not so distant future uh, as I mentioned on the right is the new Glenn vehicle, which is uh, you know, going to be able to take several uh, hundred tons to, or hundred tons to orbit. The uh, on the left is the uh, uh, SpaceX Starship uh, and the super heavy booster. Have you seen those in the news lately? They've been test flying them from uh, Brownsville, Texas, and we fully expect them to come to the Cape as well and build a launch site here adjacent to their Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9 launch pad. Uh, in the center, I had mentioned before the uh, Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser, which is going to be flying from here in the next year. Uh, on the left is uh, uh, one of the lunar landers from uh, uh, there are several companies that are building commercial lunar landers that are going to take both NASA experiments and private experiments up to the lunar surface. So what's coming up this year, uh, it's going to be a very busy year. We fully expect to beat the number of launches since uh, probably the mid 60s when we used to have this many. Right now, we've already done seven. We've got 44 more launches scheduled. Uh, the majority of these are going to be Falcon 9 um, with uh, Elon Musk's Starlink uh, Internet uh, Connectivity Satellites. He's got 16 of those missions coming up. They've got two. Uh, Crew Dragon flights and six commercial missions, as well as uh, some DOD missions and a NASA science flight. Uh, in the center is the Atlas V United Launch Alliance. They've got two flights coming up with the Boeing Starliner uh, crew capsule, as well as a couple of uh, DOD and NASA missions. And the Falcon Heavy is going to fly again. There's a couple more scheduled for this year, and uh, those are always exciting to watch and uh, very loud, a lot of fun. Some of the inaugural flights we expect to see, maybe the NASA Space Launch System is going to fly this year, although they have to get through another uh, engine testing up in Mississippi uh, before they can bring that vehicle down here to fly. But the majority of the ground infrastructure is ready to go here at, uh, at KSC, and we're looking forward to that. Uh, United Launch Alliance Vulcan is a brand new vehicle that uh, they uh, just delivered last week, the uh, Pathfinder vehicle came down from its factory in Alabama, uh, delivered via, via uh, a uh, barge basically that uh, brings it down a uh, couple of rivers to bring it here to the Cape. Uh, that's gonna be flying towards the end of the year, probably in the third or fourth quarter. And that's gonna replace the Atlas V. I mentioned the Relativity uh, Terran 1 is going to be doing its inaugural flight uh, in the fourth quarter. And uh, Generation Orbit, uh, very interesting. They're going to be, that is a uh, air-launched vehicle that's going to be flying from, uh, its carrier vehicle takes off from Cecil Spaceport outside of Jacksonville, and then it's going to come fly off the coast here and come into the instrumentation coverage of the uh, Space Force's eastern range here offshore. And the X-60A is a hypersonic test vehicle uh, that they're going to drop off of there. Basically, it's a, I think it's a G-5 uh, aircraft, and it uh, is going to carry the, uh, the X-60A here offshore, and then we'll watch it uh, with the radar and telemetry systems here at the Cape. 
So as I mentioned, 44 launches still to go. Uh, probably have a Navy Trident uh, missile or two flying from uh, a submarine as well offshore. Well, where are we going here in the future? Well, we can look back at, at what we've done in the past here. Uh, when the Cape Canaveral spaceport first stood up, it was nothing but launch. And then recently we've seen launches and landings. Now we're starting to build uh, space vehicles here. Obviously SpaceX has been reusing vehicles. Um, so now we're doing manufacturing of both launch vehicles and satellites and spacecraft here. Uh, coming up next, we're looking to do uh, logistics, start taking things back and forth to both the International Space Station and commercial space stations, which we see happening here uh, very shortly. And in the future, we expect a lot of uh, low Earth orbit support activity for both human and robotic missions uh, to orbit and uh, eventually on to Mars when that, uh, uh, that starts developing. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to be the, uh, the global spaceport or trade port for space operations. Uh, we want to do things which are going to help enable space commerce uh, from here. And that's through things like research, uh, manufacturing, and all the on-orbit services. So both uh, launching from here and coming back here uh, with their, uh, their products and their experiments. So this is... Uh, you know, this is our long-term vision to make Florida the uh, global leader in uh, space commerce, both uh, you know, all the way from uh, the supply chain through the manufacturing, uh, the satellite building, the launching uh, operations on orbit, logistics on orbit, and then bringing the uh, products or the experimental results back to Earth. Okay, well, that's... Uh, that's my quick 30 minute spiel on, on what we do at Space Florida. So I'd be happy to uh, take your questions. Any questions, guys? Make sure you unmute if you do. This is uh, Karen Brown. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, Karen. Okay. So I am on the uh, Space Coast. I, I am at Patrick Air Force Base. I am uh, currently uh, doing a PhD program um, over at FIT. So um, I did graduate from uh, Embry Riddle last year um, with a master's in. Uh, unmanned systems um, with a focus on space systems. So, um, so I'm trying to figure out how to tap into the industry or uh, maybe meet you guys at some point, you know, to figure out which direction that I need to go with um, my degree program. Uh, this is my first year at FIT, so I'm pretty much just doing you know, the basics. I really haven't gotten into the meat and potatoes of what I think that I will be researching, but it want, I, want it, I want it to be something having to do with the space program. So I just wanted to know if I, how I can reach out to you guys or any quick advice you can give me um, that might help me and help the other folks who are on, on the line. Thank you. Well, thanks for the question, Karen. Uh, there's uh, so much going on out here and, and so many new companies that are, are setting up that uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, for that. Certainly, uh, somebody like Sierra Nevada with their autonomous uh, dream chaser, I mean, they're, my guess is they are looking for folks that have, uh, they're going to have your background and, and your degree experience that's going to be uh, uh, useful for them to, to help develop the systems they need to autonomously operate that. Uh, also, you know, we're going to see some more uh, UAVs operating from here. Uh, and uh, obviously, if um, 
you know, you're not limited just to space operations, but also to aeronautical uh, UAVs. So we'll, we'll see a lot of that. Uh, you know, you can contact me through uh, Space Florida uh, website, or you can uh, send me a note. I'm at, uh, I don't think I put it on here. It just says spaceflorida.gov. But my uh, email is pmccarthy at spaceflorida.gov. So if you've got a question, uh, you can send me your info and uh, be happy to get you in touch with uh, some folks. If I can't answer it myself, I'll try and put you in touch with uh, people that know uh, what you're looking for and can uh, probably assist you. Okay, thank you. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Anybody else, folks? If not, Pat, I'm going to ask you one more question that came up. Uh, uh, I know I've hit you up earlier before everybody else got on, but I've uh, been reading a lot about the uh, ISS and Boeing. How involved are you, you all with uh, Boeing and the ISS? Well, not too much. I mean, after we helped uh, clean out the former orbiter processing facility, to get uh, Boeing's uh, crew capsule manufacturing there, the Starliner, into OPF-3. Uh, we have not been following things too closely with them. Uh, obviously, if they're looking for uh, additional opportunities to invest or to expand their operations here in the state, uh, we work with Florida DOT to, to help them find some funding for that if they're going to be bringing more jobs. So, um, that's our, our really, uh, our main uh, MO is uh, job creation. That's our tasking from, from the governor and the legislature is getting company investment and growing the number of jobs here in the state. And, uh, you know, we've got stuff scattered all around the state. I mentioned CAE uh, there in, uh, in Tampa. Uh, we've got several projects going uh, in, the, uh, in Northwest Florida as well couple of things in Southwest Florida. There's a big, uh, I'd say a, a corridor for simulation uh, companies that's uh, developed along the, uh, the West Coast. I mean, including CAE and uh, several other companies. So there's several different uh, industries that, that we've got, uh, you know, our hands in. We help to uh, develop some of the funding that they need through the financing tools that we have to help them build here in the state. So, you know, we've got a very strong business development uh, group that uh, is out beating the bushes all the time and uh, convincing people of the, the business friendly, low tax environment that we have in the state, as well as their ability to secure uh, financing and funding from, from the state and some of their uh, banking sources. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question. This is off the wall. Uh, since we're in Florida and our uh, Firestone Grand Prix of St. Petersburg takes place, the IndyCar race over here, and frequented by Andretti Autosports, you mentioned they were out on the runway uh, with their IndyCar. How much, just curiosity, you don't have to give an exact figure. You could say four figures, five figures. How much you charge them to uh, rent, a, rent the runway? It's really not that much. Um, I think it's it's bar just barely four figures for for the day. Uh, it's really not that expensive. Uh, we have a uh, a company that that handles that for us. We set up the basically the rate structure, and we have this company that uh, works with the uh, uh, automotive companies to uh, bring their stuff out here. So, you know, if you want to race up and down the runway. Yeah, there's obviously some uh, there's some insurance and indemnification regimes you have to go through to do that. We do not allow just private operators out here. It has to be somebody who's doing uh, R and D kinds of testing. So uh, you know the Indy car uh, teams obviously have uh, a lot of things they want to do. I mean, you know, we go out there and try and watch them, and they're always covers up with tarps, you know, and don't take any pictures of what we're doing, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So they're all trying to come up with the, the secret sauce that's going to make them uh, more competitive and faster. 
That's pretty awesome. There's, I think we've got one more question here uh, from fellow Tampa Network member Carrie. Uh, says, Pat, a little off topic. If you have time, can you explain some of the model rockets you fly? Well, sure, Carrie. I mean, I've been flying rockets since, uh, since I was a kid. Um, in fact, we flew, uh, we flew several demonstration launches uh, right from the Embry-Riddle campus back in the, uh, uh, back in the early 80s, which was a lot of fun. We were right there you know, in Daytona, right next to the airport. So uh, I fly, and you can see over my shoulder, there's mostly uh, scale models of, of, uh, of historical vehicles, but I also do a lot of fun flying. I fly... Uh, uh, some uh, rocket propelled gliders and things as well. I do a lot of competition flying, which is basically, um, you know, try and uh, keep your rocket up as long as possible. So duration or fly at the highest altitude given a particular engine size uh, that you're allowed to fly. So there's several different classes of competition that we fly. And it looks like uh, when it happens, I mean, it's been postponed for the last year, but uh, when it happens, whether it's later this year or next year, I've been tapped to be the uh, uh, the U.S. representative scale model judge at the World Rocket Championship. So uh, it looks like I'm going to be going to uh, Romania sometime, whether it's this year or next year, to be a, a scale model judge at the Internats. And that's uh, very exciting because you get to see you know, a hundred of the, the most spectacular scale models built by people from all over the world. I'm really looking forward to that. And looks like Lindsley has a question. It says, great presentation. Of course, I think we all say that. Is there going to be an update to the Florida Spaceport System Plan? Well, yes, thank you, Lindsley. And of course, Lindsley would know about this because she used to work with us in Space Florida and did a great job and helped pull together things like the Florida Spaceport System Plan. So yes, Lindsley, we are working on an update to that, uh, both the Spaceport System Plan, which is the, the statewide one, and the Cape Canaveral Spaceport Master Plan itself. So uh, both of those uh, products are, are in development now. We hire several uh, engineering firms to help uh, develop those plans, just like you do a master plan uh, at an airport. You know, every couple of years you have to update it based on who your customers are going to be and what kind of uh, uh, work you want to do there. So uh, we're working on that now, and I think it's going to be out uh, probably the end of this year is what we're targeting for this, the statewide system plan. And one more question. How has it pandemic impacted operations? Well, interestingly enough, uh, Wendy, it, it really hasn't. I mean, uh, most of us are working from home that, that can. Uh, I go in maybe once to twice a week to, to work with our construction company that's doing some refurbishment on our, some facilities and launch pads. Uh, the majority of the folks are working from home, but the uh, what they call the essential personnel that are actually working on the hardware, prepping the rockets, uh, getting the launch pads ready for a launch are allowed on base. And there are obviously some pretty strict protocols about mask wearing and social distancing whenever possible. But the, when you look at the launch rate that we're going to have this year, uh, you know, it's going to be at least one a week if uh, SPEX keeps up their pace. So, uh, you know, the operations are continuing. The Space Force is doing a great job of uh, keeping the range clear and uh, keeping the systems operational so that we can uh, maintain a high launch cadence. Well, I, I'm watching the clock. Otherwise, I know uh, Edmund will be twirling his finger to say wind it up. And I want to thank you, Pat, for, uh, for joining us. Uh, you know you've become an honorary a uh, member of the Tampa Bay Network by doing this, just an FYI. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> and just for my network folks that are on the call, that our next program will probably be later in April. Uh, already got to figure out who I'm going to uh, chase after, but I'm not going to say anything until it's firmed up. But until then, 
go on the website and there are a ton of virtual events uh, out there that you can pick and choose to join. And I encourage everybody to get on something and network with your other alum. Now, I guess it would be fair to say, I'm gonna, I see who popped on here at the last minute. I guess we will give Bill Thompson the last word. Or maybe not. Bill, you're on if you wanna speak. While, while Bill comes on, I'd like to once again say a very big thank you to Pat for the presentation this evening. Uh, virtual round of applause, Pat. Thank you very much for enlightening us with all the great things going on at Space Florida. It's amazing to see all the things coming, coming in our backyard. And also, I mean, in different states, it really shows how our industry keeps growing and how we can work remotely from different locations to accomplish our mission. So thank you very much. Uh, Bart, once again, thank you for setting up this program. It's, uh, once again, as I mentioned earlier, it's a lifelong learning initiative. As you can tell, alumni always like to learn. So thank you very much for bringing this event to us. All right, now to Bill, since Bart called on you. Yes, and I was gonna try to hide on this one all the time, Bart. I, I just try to do my best to hide. Not gonna um, happen. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, first off, Patrick, uh, excellent. And thank you everybody again. Uh, Patrick, I know you've been on here two nights in a row. I see the Amber Riddle alumni, Amber Riddle family, uh, lots of folks out there, but uh, I will throw kudos back to Bart. Uh, it is such a uh, pleasure to have a network leader who dedicates his time, his energy. He truly is a forever an eagle. He cares about our Embry-Riddle family. Uh, he wants to make sure things are going on. So uh, Bart is one of the best employees we've never hired, uh, but uh, he is absolutely awesome. He truly is forever an eagle. Uh, Pat, thank you again, two nights in a row. Uh, boy, did I hear some stories about you last night that I cannot share, uh, but one of, one of them is, how meticulous you have always been on building rockets, on your love for space and your love for aviation uh, and your level of detail. There's no question about it. Uh, and you've carried it forward for such a long time. Absolutely incredible. So uh, well, thank thanks you. so much, Bill. Uh, let me put my plug in. Uh, if you folks are not donating to the school to help the uh, alumni scholarship funds, that's one thing you need to do. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and again, Edmund, Michelle, the rest of the team, thank you so much for all this. We're all very busy, but this is fantastic stuff. I look forward to seeing everybody again yeah. on another one soon. Okay. Thank you, guys. And uh, we'll, we'll call it a quit. I think we we're a minute over. There we go. So we'll see you all awesome. later. Awesome. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye, 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 Bye. Bye.